Welcome to episode 141 of 10 Minute Record Reviews, and if you like what I'm doing, please do subscribe at the end of the video. I'd really appreciate it. This time, I'm excited to be able to talk about a Kudu record, Grover Washington's debut from 1971, Inner City Blues. This is the first U.S. pressing of this tremendous record with Grover with his chest hair and amazing boots on the back. Uh, and of course, he would go on to be a mainstay of Creed Taylor's Kudu label. It was only moderately successful in terms of sales, but it was extremely influential on the whole jazz world for the rest of the decade and had a lot of influence, particularly on other jazz saxophonists, because what it did was give them a different tonal and lyrical template to what you would have heard from the hard bop and post bop sax players. This is also an album which divides opinions. On the one hand, it's the start of an amazing career in jazz funk. It also breathes life into this incredible label, which gave us so much great music in the 70s. But at the same time, there's a lot of people, I guess you could call them stodgepots, who see this as the beginning of the end. That, sure, this was all well and good and a bit different, but the popification and the r and bification of jazz begins a long process of watering down, and eventually at the end of this, Grover's doing Wine Light, you get the emergence of Kenny G, and the whole crudescence of smooth jazz as found in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jazzy dinner music Spotify playlists. But none of this is Grover's fault. He, Creed Taylor, and the musicians they were working with knew that jazz had to change in order to be able to survive in the early 1970s, and this, at the time, was a breath of fresh air. Grover Washington's bio has a lot in common with the life stories of so many of the black musicians who became the giants of jazz in the 1960s and 1970s. The Rust Belt birth, he was from Buffalo, New York, a family who was solid in the church but also huge jazz fans, getting given an instrument at a young age, learning to play it, child prodigy, and sneaking into jazz clubs as a teenager to be able to hear his idols when they came through Buffalo. The only place where Grover's life story is atypical is that he doesn't actually have famous jazz musician friends while he's growing up. Instead, he has a basically unremarkable career as a young jazz player. After he leaves high school, he's in a few jazz groups, tours the Midwest to not much acclaim. Then he gets drafted into the army, and there he actually does make a key connection, and that's with Billy Cobham. Billy introduces him to his whole network in New York City, and after he leaves the army, Grover makes the rounds, he makes his own connections, his wife was his manager, and they both decide the place to settle is not New York, but actually Philly, which of course has a great jazz tradition of its own. He's getting increasing amounts of session work thanks to the connections that he's made, and so he's popping up to New York now and then to make recordings. He has a regular standing gig to play with Charles Erland, and he actually appears in one of Charles Erland's live albums, and he also gets to know Idris Muhammad. Through these connections, he begins to get drawn to Creed Taylor's world, and his first big break comes when he's asked to play on the very first release by Taylor's new subsidiary label, Kudu, which was very much focused on black soul jazz and jazz funk. And that record was this one, Johnny Hammond Smith's Breakout. Poor Johnny, I almost think he looks a little bit sweaty in these photos. Anyway, great record, however. And Taylor was so impressed with Washington's playing that he signs him up then and there to be one of his in-house crew of session musicians. Shortly thereafter, Grover gets another big break because on the third release that Kudu did, Hank Crawford was supposed to be the leader. And so the whole band had come in in September 1971, but then someone said, well, where's Hank? He's got to play his alto leads. And it turned out that Hank was actually in Europe. So Taylor says to Grover, look, can you play alto? And Grover could, but he hadn't played much alto in a while, but he said, sure, and what are you going to say? And so he ends up making his debut. And it's kind of an amazing thing for a guy who really, outside of session circles, was basically unknown, to be making his debut album with a full string section, horn section, Creed Taylor producing, Rudy Van Gelder on the sliders in Rudy's own studio, and with an incredible cast of session musicians. So he set up perfectly here, and the performance in the album doesn't disappoint. As I mentioned, this record is engineered by Rudy Van Gelder, and it's produced by Taylor, more about him in a second. It's also arranged by Bob James. James was instrumental in the arrangement, conducting, and the overall production of so many of the CTI and Kudu releases during this particular decade. There was a huge cast of musicians on here, but the other ones that really are worth mentioning are Ron Carter, who plays bass, of course, the former Miles Davis stalwart, Eric Gale, who's really just starting his career as a session guy, and two other key members of the rhythm section. Idris Muhammad is a drummer, that mainstay of so much great jazz funk in the 1970s, and the Brazilian percussionist Erto Moreira, who had a burgeoning solo career of his own. A few words on Creed Taylor, who's kind of central to the story of this album as well. He'd worked with a whole bunch of different legends. He'd worked with Mingus in the 1950s. He, of course, famously assigned Coltrane to Impulse in the 1960s, and then immediately left for Verve, where famously he was the architect of those great Stan Getz-led Bossa Nova crossover attempts in the mid 1960s. 1960s, becoming a Grammy winner for his efforts. And by the late 1960s, jazz crossover stuff was basically his stock in trade. He'd worked with Wes Montgomery, producing the album Road Song. 
He'd also worked with George Benson on the album The Other Side of Abbey Road. These kinds of albums got bad press at the time from jazz critics as basically being sellout albums. They're increasingly appreciated these days, along with so much of Taylor's other output. Why is that? Well, Taylor was basically committed to top-notch quality all across the board. He worked with amazing musicians as leaders. He had an incredible stable of session players. He worked frequently with Rudy Van Gelder, who had both the best studio and also probably the best touch in the sliders, producing this incredible warm sound. And the quality of what Taylor put out even extended to the packaging. You had these amazing laminated covers, gatefold covers, which kind of stood out on the shelf. With Kudu, Taylor was taking all that he'd learned in the 1960s and putting it into practice. And the formula was pretty simple. Infuse jazz with popular music. Have it be played by jazz musicians at the top of their game and have high quality bass heavy production that really invited you to dance. And so for me, the CTI and Kudu era is as great as anything Creed Taylor did in the 1960s. In that decade, he'd been the midwife of the whole international bossa nova craze, which still echoes today at cocktail parties. Not that anyone has cocktail parties at the moment, but you know what I mean. In the 1970s, he's a supporter and the facilitator of so much great black jazz music that reclaimed jazz's place as a truly popular music and ruffled the feathers of the critics. And this album, which went to number two in the jazz charts, is one of the very first shots across the bow of that critical establishment. This album has no originals on it, and it starts with one of the great covers of any song and one of the great jazz funk tracks, and that's Grover's cover of Marvin Gaye's Inner City Blues, and there are so many highlights on this track. Ron Carter is laying down a bass line that Bootsy Collins would be happy with, Idris on drums, air to on percussion, just on fire. You also get an early taste of that great funky guitar style that Eric Gale was going to bring to so many Kudu records in the coming years. But really, the true star here is Grover. His soloing here, which is tremendous, and again, it's an alto, which hadn't really played much in the previous couple of years, is incredible. And I think what upset the jazz critics here is that his playing really has much more in common with Maceo Parker than it does with Sonny Rollins or John Coltrane or Wayne Shorter. It's a mistake, I think, to listen to this song and just be focused on, oh my God, this leads to smooth jazz and so on. Well, yeah, maybe somehow, although again, it's not Grover's fault. When this comes out, jazz has basically disappeared up its own ass. As much as I love these records, there was not a lot of commercial appeal to free jazz, there was not a lot of commercial appeal to spiritual jazz. Miles Davis was shedding listeners by the bucket load with each electric noodling release that he put out in the early 1970s. In short, jazz was losing its audience, and this song was a hit at a time when jazz had very little radio appeal, and it makes jazz relevant again. Georgia On My Mind is kind of a song of two halves, not so much a head arrangement as really the first full half of the song is his somewhat overproduced and kind of syrupy arrangement. But the second half of the song is great because Eric and Grover both have tremendous solos and that playing makes it worth sitting through the first half of the song. That's followed by the closing track on side one, which is the second of the two Marvin Gaye covers, and this is Mercy Mercy Me the Ecology. This is a slow, steamy cooker of a song. Grover has this totally passionate solo, and then, beautifully, it's all stripped down for Bob James to give us a little bit of a solo on Fender Rhodes, which I always love. And the nice part about that, too, is because it's so stripped down, you can hear Ron Carter's bass really well, which is phenomenal. Side 2 starts with a cover of Bill Withers' Ain't No Sunshine, and this starts super mellow, kind of like a J.J. Cale song. It's amazing how tight this band is, and you can really tell that in these slow passages. The I Know, I Know, I Know bit is done by backup singers. Gale then has a solo which is thrillingly underpinned by Carter's work. The energy totally rises here, but then the mellowness returns to the song like a warm wind, and Grover's tone in the solo is superb. The second song on side two is Until It's Time For You To Go, which is a Buffy St. Marie cover. There are some interesting risks taken in the arrangement here, which actually work, I think. You get this cello and Fender Rhodes introduction, which then gives way to kind of a bossa nova beat, which is an interesting take. I think it actually really works. Unfortunately, you can't really say that for the last song on the record. This is I Loves You Porgy, of course, the Gershwin standard, which had made Nina Simone famous. For the first half of this track, they basically play it straight, which is not that interesting, frankly, to listen to. Somehow, this song just does not equal the sum of its parts. This is a great record, but it's an imperfect record. It's marred at times by some production choices, and particularly some arrangement choices made by Bob James. But you have to say that of the six songs in this record, the three covers of contemporary R&B hits, as well as the cover of the Buffy St. Marie song, are all amazing. This was a key record in setting out the stall for Kudu in terms of what we could expect of this label in future with the stellar production techniques, the incredible talent both in the studio but also in the booth. So it's pretty fascinating in itself as an historical document. As I mentioned, it sounds incredible. Grover would get better, but here he's pretty darn good, and I give this record four out of five stars.